If you're an Eagle user, you're probably aware that Autodesk decided to drop support for Eagle starting 2026, forcing users to transition to Fusion 360. This is a great opportunity to explore other PCB design tools. Flux offers modern collaboration tools like Easy Sharing and the Community Library of Parts, a version control system that automatically saves your progress and lets you restore any changes at any point in time, and a built-in AI hardware design assistant to help you design PCB much faster. My name is Nico, and in this tutorial, we're going to cover everything you need to know for a smooth transition from Eagle to Flux. So let's get started. The first screen you'll see when you sign up to Flux is your profile page. It's similar in many ways to the control panel in Eagle. Here you'll find a list of projects that you've contributed to or that somebody else shared with you. You can use the filter here to search for specific projects. Here also in your profile page, you find access to our documentation and tutorials. By clicking here, you'll find a list of tutorials ranging from collaboration, AI access to workflows, components, etc. Every component of Flux is collaboration. We made it super easy to find and search for different users or even projects that have been shared with the public. You can use the search bar here in the top left to do so. Another great way to find projects is to use the Featured Projects menu here on the right. This is a curated list of community projects made by the Flux team. If you find the project that you like, you can click on it to open it. And we also made it super easy to create your own copy of it. Just click on the Flux menu and clone. This will immediately create a copy of this project in your own profile that you can go ahead and edit. If you go back to our profile page, you'll see that this new project has been created. Another aspect of collaboration is our community library of parts. This is something different that you find in Eagle. Here, there's one unique library of parts where you find all the parts created by the community as well as parts that you've created yourself. We'll go more in depth about how you find specific parts here in the library. But for example, if we type STM32, we find the list of parts that are related to that term. We'll talk about some of these filters later in the video. If you're coming from Eagle, you'll be familiar with terms like device, footprint, 3D package, and symbol. So let's see how those match in Flux. When we right-click and open one of these parts, it will be similar as if you were looking at the device itself. If you go to the PCB, you find its footprint, and in the 3D view, you find the 3D package. At this point, you might have noticed that we don't have a specific editor for parts. It's the same one that we do for projects. So how is a project different from a part? Let's take a look at that. As an example, we have here two different parts or projects that are basically the same, but one is called part and one is called project. So let's see what the difference is between them. Initially, it seems like they are exactly the same. The difference between a part and a project is that a part has been published to the library. For example, if we look at this project here, the publish to library menu is available, but when we go to the part, it just published changes. In this case, it means that this project has already been published so let's see how this looks in the project. If we copy the part name and we create a new project, looking at that part in the library, we'll throw one single result, and that is the part one. When we drag this part into the library, we'll see another big difference. The view here from the part is very different from the internal view of the part. If we click on the part, we only see its terminals. But if we go to the project, we'll see its symbol. That's another great difference between Flux and Eagle. There's a few ways to generate symbols in Flux. The most complicated one is if you want to add an external symbol. To do that, you need to go to the Assets menu, click on Manage, and then add an SVG or SDXF file. We have a link down in the description if you want to learn more about how to create your own custom symbols. If there's no DXF or SVG symbol present in the Assets menu, Flux will create a default symbol. That this full symbol is the one that you'll usually see in ICs. It's basically a rectangle with pins on the right and left for each one of the terminals. So to recap, when you open a part and you see its, its internal view, you will only see the number of terminals that the part has. You need then to create a symbol or use the default symbol and publish it to the library. When the part has been published to the library, you'll see its external symbol when it's dragged into a project. Now let's talk about Flux modules. They're basically the same thing as design blocks in Eagle. The only difference is that when you drag a model into your canvas, you'll see it as a single part. When you open it, 
you'll see the full schematic of the module. That's why when you open a part, you only see terminals, because a part doesn't contain any other parts inside, but a module does. It also contains a full PCB layout. You can drag and rotate a module as if it was a single part. Finally, modules work in the exact same way as part work. If you want to create a module, you just need to create a project and then publish it to the library. If you make any change to the module, you need to publish the changes, the same way that we do with your parts. So let's now take a look at the schematic editor. The first thing you notice is that there are no limits to the sheet on our schematic, it's an infinite canvas, meaning that you can keep scrolling out and add as many components as you want. Another interesting aspect is that the built-in collaboration means that you can add comments directly into the schematic, right where you want them. For example, in this case, you can also use comments to interact with Copilot, our AI hardware assistant. Copilot can help you out with part selection, debugging, suggesting part alternatives, or anything of the sort. We have a full tutorial about Copilot linked out in the description. Another way that you can interact with Copilot is by going here to the chat menu. Here, instead of pinning comments directly in the schematic, you can use the chat to either chat with the pilot or any other user that's invited into your project. Remember that to add any other users to your project, you need to go to the share menu and either make your design fully public or click on the advanced button and add users manually. As we mentioned before, another key aspect is the library of parts. So let's go through the filters that we have here. The first thing is just that by typing any part that you want, you're gonna find different alternatives. But if you want to further filter the set results, you can use some of the filters here. You can filter by components that are yours, components that you've started or favorite previously, components that have footprints or sub layouts, or even components that have a simulation model attached, a 3D model, manufacturer part numbers or data sheets, etc. The manufacturer part number is particularly important. Any part that has a manufacturer part number will get automatically searched by flags in the main distributors like DigiKey, Mouser, and JLC PCB, and you get real-time feedback about the stock levels, quantities, and pricing of each one of those parts. That's a huge help nowadays that many of these parts are not currently in stock. Once you drag a few parts into a design, you can click on the objects menu and find them individually. This is similar to the selection filter that you find in Eco. Here, you can filter by designator, part number, or any individual keywords. If you double click on the part, the part will automatically get highlighted and zoomed in. You can click and drag any of these parts or rotate them using the keyword shortcuts. If you want to take a look at the keyword shortcuts, you can click on the flex menu and then go to keyword shortcuts. In this case, I'm using macOS, so the ones highlighted here are the ones for macOS. If you're using Windows or Linux, you're going to have those ones specifically highlighted. Another important aspect is how do you actually connect all these parts together? As you can see, wherever you can connect a part, you're gonna have this dot highlighted. You just click on it and then drag to create a connection. Once you're done, just basically click on the target and the connection will be done. Hitting F in your keyboard will change the elbow direction. If you wanna connect components that are in different parts of the schematic without having to run a wire across the whole schematic, what you do is you go to the library, you find the portal part, you drag it into your canvas, connect it to the target, change the designator to whatever makes sense for that specific one. In this case, we're gonna call it test one. And then you either copy and paste it somewhere else, or you can drag a new portal from the library. And in this case, as soon as I connect it, now if I click on this net, all the nets will be highlighted, meaning that this net is now connected to this net key here is that the designator of the portal needs to be exactly the same. As soon as I change this for something else, the next will not be connected. The same principle works for things like grounds or powers. All these symbols are actually parts in the library. In the case of ground, you can type ground or you likely have it in the top of your library, but you also have power net portals or the generic net portals that I just mentioned. An important thing about ground is that as soon as I place a ground connection here in schematic, I will get a copper field automatically on my PCB. But we're going to discuss that more in depth when we talk about the PCB editor later. Finally, let's talk about part properties. As soon as I click on a part, I'm going to have all the part information selected in this vector here. Scrolling down, we see some of the properties here. As we mentioned before, the manufacturer part number property is particularly important because that's what Flux uses 
to serve that part in the main distributors and get automatic pricing and availability. There could be cases where the part that you drive from the library doesn't have a manufacturer part number. That can be easily fixed by clicking on Edit, Add, and then add the manufacturer part number that you want. If you type manufacturer part number, and then add the value here, that will get automatically added, and Flux will immediately start looking for pricing and availability in VGK and Mouser. Now that we know about properties, let's take a look back at the portal here. As we mentioned before, portals, grounds, and even power portals are all basically just standard parts. The only thing that they have in common is they have a part type that's called portal. What this part type does is it signals Flux that anything connected to any of the pins on this part should be connected together. So you can create your own portals just by adding a part type portal to any part. Okay, so let's now clear this up and talk about the PC behavior. You might have already noticed that when I went to the PCB editor before, there was no ECO required to add this capacitor to the PCB editor. In Flux, the schematics and PCB editors are automatically synchronized, meaning that any change that happens on any editor will automatically be reflected on the other editor. Parts on the PCB editor can get repositioned by clicking on them and dragging, or by using the toolbar if you want to set a specific position. Routing parts is similar to connecting things on the schematic. When you hover over, you're going to see this white dot changing colors. Clicking on that dot will automatically get the traits. Similarly, you can hit the F key to change the elbow direction. You can also use the W key in your keyboard to switch between some predetermined widths. Predetermined widths can be changed by adding PCB design rules. We're going to talk about PCB design rules in a second. Before we go there, we're going to take a look at how to change the layout. The layout in Flux is also an object like any other part is. You can click on it to select it, you're going to see this toolbar here that allows you to change the size or the corner ease of the layout. You can also change the layout shape and make it a circle. That's also done with PCB rules, so let's take a look at what those are. PCB design rules are the way that you interact with basically any object on the PCB editor. You have rules for changing sizes, shapes, and basically any other behavior that any object in the PCB editor can have. As an example, let's try to change the shape of the PCB layout. As soon as I click on the layout, I'm going to have the layout rule panel displayed here have some pre-populated rules like size, position, and trace with here in our layout, but we can add more to change other behaviors. For example, by clicking on edit and add, we can add the shape rule to change the layout shape. The layout shape rule, for example, comes preloaded with some default values. In this case, if I select circular, my layout will automatically become a circle. I can also change the size or the position of the circle if I want it. This is very convenient if you need a shape that's either a circle or a rectangle. But what happens if you want something more complex? Flux allows you to do this by importing either SVG or DXF files. If you want to add one of those DXF or SVG files to change your layout shape, what you need to do is click on the empty canvas, scroll down to the Assets menu, and then add the layout object. Once it's done, click on the layout. You need to add an Assets rule. And that rule will come pre-populated with the file I just added. Clicking on the layout, you will automatically get the shape that you just added as a file. This is also very quickly to undo. If you click on the layout again and then disable the rule, the layout will go back to its original shape. These rules also apply if you want to change the width of a trace, the shape or size of a pad, idea, etc. Now let's take a look at some of the more advanced routing features that Flux has. One of the main ones is the differential pair routing. In this case, we have a USB-C connector placed. The data minus and data plus signals should be differential pair routed. In fact, that is super easy. As soon as you select one of those traces, in this case, since this is a USB-C connector, it has two pins for D plus and two pins for D minus. By hovering, you'll automatically see that both D minus and D plus signals get automatically highlighted. Clicking on one of those will automatically create a differential pair. These differential pair traces work in the exact same way as a single-ended one. You can use your mouse to direct them, hit the F key to change the elbow direction, and even hit the W key to change the trace width. I would also like to highlight that these traces are not only differential paired, but also impedance matched. What that means is that the original trace width that Flux selected was the correct one based on the current stack app that you have selected. Now that I have changed the trace width, that will no longer be impedance matched. If I want to go back, I just hit the escape key and then reroute with the original rule. If we need to continue routing on another layer, 
you just need to use the right click and then select the layer you want to continue routing on. If you click on the mid layer one, Plus will automatically place the vias that go from layer one to mid layer one. Another feature that we already touched on is the automatic copper fields. If you go to the layer view menu, you will see this drop like icon. If you click on it, the copper fields get visible. By default, all these copper fields will automatically be tied to ground, but you can connect them to any other net that you want. We have a link down in the description if you want to know more about how these copper fields work. Finally, Flex also has a DRC system. If you click on this menu, you get displayed all the DRC that we currently have. We keep adding more DRC checks every week. Once you've checked that your design has no errors, you can go to the Flex menu and then to the Sport menu and you'll find all the Gerber, Bill of Materials and Pick and Play Flex exports that you need. That should give you a good overview of all the key differences between Eagle and Flux. I've left a few links with more information down in the description if you're interested in more. See you in the next one.